So I'd like to introduce Dr. Sheila Dean, a uh, permanent nutritionist, and she would like to talk to you about metabolic syndrome and beyond. Okay. So, wow. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Sorry I'm not having to sort of hold this funky mic in front of my mouth like this. Um, I'm really happy to be here this morning. I wanted to take a moment to thank Dr. Um, Fraser Stevenson for calling on me to come here and teach at your very nice College of Medicine. And also thank you to Dr. Johnson for reaching out to me and inviting me to come here this morning to speak to your group this morning. Um, I'm especially happy for the fact that your um, school has identified the need for nutrition education for medical students. As you probably know, uh, nutrition education is uh, generally not a high priority for most medical schools. And uh, being that I'm a nutritionist, <laughs> I don't know if it's my bias, but I really think that um, more and more of you medical students, you, you, you future doctors, are really going to need to know some of the basics and ideally really start to learn higher level nutritional medicine because it really is all about the tools in your toolkit, isn't it? You know, and there's some pretty sophisticated tools when it comes to nutritional medicine. And by the way, your patients are going to ask you some pretty tough questions. And um, you want to be able to have more than just muscle magazine information in your head to give back to them, right? You're going to want to have some kind of basic understanding to be able to share with your patients because today, more than ever, more than even just five years ago, you know, People are aware eating organic isn't just something that hippies do. <laughs> All right, so you need to know this stuff. Um, I want to mention that I don't even have an hour to be able to get into this with you, and I realize that we, um, we have a lot to cover. So I have a lot of slides. I'm going to whip through um, some of them quickly. I'm going to talk about some of them in more in depth. And... Um, Hopefully, if you have any other questions, my email is Sheila, that's S-H-E-I-L-A, at Dr. D-R Dean, D-E-A-N, nutrition.com. You're welcome to email me any questions. You're welcome to reach me at my office. I've got my contact information on the last slide that I'll leave up for you. I'm also going to stick around uh, for a few minutes afterwards if you have any questions. All right. So what we see in the media is pretty much a direct reflection of the state of affairs with respect to our nation's health, isn't it? Right? I mean, these images are clearly a sign of the times. So do you need a degree to know that obesity is something that is related to the food that we eat? <laughs> Probably not. Right? But did you know that Many of your chronic degenerative diseases are related to what you eat, to your food, to your nutrition. Let me ask you this question. I know that you guys are first year medical students. All right, so I know it's kind of early in, uh, in the trajectory here, but how many of you guys have a feeling or have an idea uh, if you're going to go into, uh, let's say, primary care? Anybody? Can you raise your hand so I can get an idea? All right, what about family medicine? Okay. What about, all right, let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you the other way around. Anybody know if they want to go into, like, acute care, emergency care medicine? All right, so I'm, I'm, it's hard for me to figure out, but so there's just a few of you who are planning going into acute uh, care or, or chronic care medicine. You know, there's really a very big difference between the two, right? When it comes to acute care medicine, when it comes to, um, emergency medicine, Western medicine shines. We truly have to pay homage to Western medicine because, man, they will save your life. Right? They will lock down your physiology, they will pump you full of drugs, and they will save your life. Right? If you're having an emergency, do not call me. Go to the ER. But when it comes to chronic disease, you guys, your patients are going to ask you, doctor, is it possible that there's a relationship between what I'm eating and my disease? And I would like to suggest to you that that answer is actually yes. Okay, and I'm not just talking about obesity and type 2 diabetes, which is kind of obvious by now. 
right? And so it's not only the focus of my, dis my discussion today to get into all, all of those details, but I just want to put out there, I want to plant that seed for you to start to consider and broaden your mind to the idea that food does play a significant role in chronic and degenerative diseases. And if you decide that you're going to go or not going to go into an acute situation or, um, or emergency medicine, urgent care, if you end up being a primary care doc, a family medicine doc, or some kind of specialist that sees dis people with diseases, where 90 chronic disease, where 90% of what's walking in is chronic disease, then you really need to know something about nutrition. <coughs> I want to mention also that I'm very glad that Candace brought up, but it's really not just about the quantity. It's not just about calories. Obviously, calories count, but it's also about the quality of those calories. We're starting to learn more and more that it's about the quality of those calories. Example, very, very simple example. I, as an example, am not going to recommend to my patient to go eat diet jello just because there's no calories and sugar, right, if they have type 2 diabetes, right? Because what is diet jello other than water and some red dye and some artificial chemical sweetener, right? So we really want to be aware and mindful of the quality of the calories as well. Um, I want to just bring to your attention, uh, Candace did a great job giving you some statistics. I wanted to just um, also show you this study where I think on the right side there we see that those who have a BMI of greater than 30, I mean that's pretty obvious that the rate of cardiometabolic syndrome would be behind those individuals. Uh, and this comes from the NHANES study, so this is some solid research here. And also in the middle column there, uh, those rep BMI of 25 to 30, or really it's 29.9, represent those who are overweight. And so it, it is also not terribly surprising that you see about almost half of those individuals um, having cardiometabolic syndrome. But this is kind of surprising. People with a BMI of less than 25, that's considered normal weight, can go on to develop metabolic syndrome. Right, so we want to also be aware of that. So that's going to be a part of this conversation. We'll take a look at that. So what I want to do is kind of take a couple of minutes to flesh out the difference between insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Where I think Candace uh, mentioned briefly that metabolic syndrome, generally speaking, is where your patient has three out of these five different symptoms. So increased waist circumference, low HDL, high triglyceride, triglycerides, high fasting glucose, and high blood pressure. So if you have three of those five symptoms, you um, te technically are a candidate for um, metabolic syndrome, or you can be diagnosed with that. But insulin resistance is really sort of the step before, sort of the setting the stage for metabolic syndrome. So I want to take a moment to really get into that. I think that's really important. We use the word a lot. Um, I think what, where I would start this conversation is by saying that insulin resistance is not something that you just wake up with. Okay, it's not black and white. There are shades of gray. It's it's a disease, or I should say, like other chronic uh, degenerative diseases, it's something that exists on what I would call a continuum. Do you follow what I'm saying here? This, let me tell you, if you guys walk out of here and you get nothing else, this is the slide that I would like for you to pay attention to. This is really important. <coughs> so insulin resistance is a scenario, and we'll talk about the pathophysiology about this in a, in a few of the later slides, but generally speaking, is a scenario where you have elevated insulin, but you can have normal blood sugar. All right, so let's think about that. Normal blood sugar technically can go as high as what? You can be as high as 99. That's the cutoff, right? Didn't Candace tell you what, the, what prediabetes was? She said 100 to what? 125. That's prediabetes or IGT, impaired glucose tolerance. So hyperinsulinemia, hyper too much insulinemia in the blood, so too much insulin in the blood with maintenance of normal blood sugar is technically referred to as compensated hyperinsulinemia. So what I'm saying is that when your patient presents with a fasting blood sugar of 98, 
ding, 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 you should start thinking about the possibility that this person might be insulin resistant, especially if they're walking in with an elevated BMI. We said that you don't have to have a high BMI to have metabolic syndrome. And so this is something you want to be aware of. And this is really the time, and this is really where I want to mention that that you want to be aware of making or, or, or starting to at least be aware that something's going on and don't just dismiss this patient. Now, if they're complaining that they're frequently hungry and again, if their blood pressure is elevated, if their, um, their BMI is elevated, just because their blood sugar is uh, 98, which is technically considered normal, doesn't mean that everything's okay. This is really a very good time to maybe check what? What might you check if you suspect that they're insulin resistant? You might want to check their insulin. You know, you guys talk a lot about checking the blood glucose, which is a very simple blood test on a metabolic panel, no biggie, right? You can even do a little finger prick in the office or something, maybe a venipuncture if you've got a phlebotomist, but you might want to check their insulin levels. Now, I want to mention that there's a big difference between functional regions, ranges and ranges that really um, look at pathology. On some of the labs, you'll see reference ranges for insulin that go as high as 25. But I'm here to tell you that that is absolutely absurd. Anybody whose fasting insulin is higher than 25 is sick. That is full-blown, overt disease. What I would like to suggest to you is that your insulin levels really shouldn't be higher than about 6. And if you're young and athletic, I would guarantee you that your blood sugar, your, excuse me, your fasting insulin is probably not higher than 6 or 7. Okay? So... Now, I think uh, Candice mentioned briefly A1C. Uh, so if you guys aren't familiar with A1C or hemoglobin A1C, once again, A1C is a number that is, re uh, is expressed in percentages that reflects your average blood sugar over a two to three month period of time and uh, correlates with blood sugar. So we said that A1C, you know, there are different reference ranges. Uh, A1C between 4.0 and 6.0 is considered pretty, pretty controlled. But we're not waiting until our patients have these crazy numbers before we decide to say something about it. Let me move on. So then once you get to the point where your body just can't do that anymore, it just can't maintain those normal blood sugars anymore, eventually the blood sugars it just start to creep up. And now the patient's coming in with a fasting blood sugar of, say, 107. But I want to tell you that most physicians, especially endocrinologists, will not even bat an eye at a blood sugar of 107. Yet look where they are on this continuum. They potentially could have been hyperinsulinemic for a decade before they got to that point. Do you understand what I'm telling you guys? What I am saying is that it's not just about blood sugar. This concept of checking fasting insulin is actually really important because you can have normal blood sugar and have an elevated fasting insulin which is the beginning of the disease process. So by the time you, you get to becoming impaired glucose tolerant or pre-diabetic, this is uncom uncompensated hyperinsulinemia. And then, of course, if that continues on and all you told your patient was, um, just watch your diet. You didn't bother to refer. You didn't really do anything about it. You just said, just watch your diet. What do you think that's probably going to lead to? What do you think that really means to anybody? That doesn't really mean a whole lot to anybody. So eventually, you end up with diabetes. And now that costs a lot of money to deal with. That's expensive. Diabetes is an expensive disease, isn't it? Meters, strips, medications, nutrition diabetic education. It's not cheap being sick. Now, I just want to mention also at this point that, you guys, it's, I do get, okay, some real real world stuff. I get that um, in the real world, you may ha not have more than 10 minutes to speak with your patient. I think that it was wonderful that Candace um, really um, suggested that, you know, you guys uh, should be talking nutrition with your patients. I can tell you, you probably won't have a, enough time to even bring it up. If you mention a couple of words, that would be wonderful. But as I was mentioning to one of the other medical students who approached me uh, just a few minutes earlier, what do you think you should do if you don't have the time? Well, for heaven's sakes, refer. You have a whole team of, pay of, of health professionals standing by ready and waiting to serve you, the physician, dietitians, nutrition educators, programs. If you don't have the time, just refer out. And I also want to mention that sometimes it's tricky because you're going to come to find out that 
you're not going to get paid very much to take 45 minutes to sit down and talk to your patients about diabetes and food. All right, and it's going to be, it's not necessarily going to be the most um, practical thing for you. And you're not going to, you know, the ICD-9 code for uh, pre-diabetes is not something that reimburses very well. Yes, because it is a business, you do have to pay your nurses and you have to pay your, your people, right? And so I want you to keep in mind that sometimes there can be a conflict of interest about what you do and what's good medicine. Just r real world stuff. So that this is an important slide to understand that, that the continuum of pathology in, pathology in general starts with these initial biochemical alterations where you don't necessarily have any overt symptoms, i.e. a fasting blood sugar of 98, but maybe their insulin level is 20, 19. And then eventually, as things go on without any kind of dietary intervention, you have this impaired cellular function leading to certain subclinical manifestations. Um, an example of that, even though this is a totally different subject, might be a patient who presents with a TSH, which is your thyroid stimulating hormone of something like 4, which technically is in within range, but anybody who really knows endocrinology knows that four, a TSH of 4 is just too darn high. That's hypothyroid. That's subclinical hypothyroid. You need to do something. You don't just let that go. And then eventually you have these morpholo morphological or functional changes, which is a re what you see in early stage disease. That might be something like impaired glucose tolerance or prediabetes. And then finally you have diagnosed pathology. You know, and this is just not a very cost effective way, way to, to handle medicine. This is an expensive way. And by the way, this is sort of old school. You know, it's out more and more we're starting to understand that really we need, to, we need to, early detection and prevention is really the key. And this idea of waiting until it's all broken and then we fix it is not only expensive, it's not sustainable. So that most chronic diseases which are demonstrably improved over time with appropriate nutritional intervention begin with metabolic and biochemical changes. So that functional interpretation of lab data allows earlier identification of changes, meaning we're not waiting for ranges to fall in the pathology range, but rather in these tight optimal ranges is eventually what we're, you know, the ideal way to sort of at least be aware of. Okay, so take a look at this interesting paper. This was published in the American Journal of Medicine in 2008 where this author showed that for every one milligram per deciliter above 85 of, of blood sugar, Okay, now remember, keep in mind, what do we say normal, technically normal was? You can go as high as what? 99. But for every one milligram above 85, that there was a 50% increased risk for developing diabetes. And in subjects where fasting glucose was only 80 <laughs> or higher, there was microvascular damage to the arteries. Very powerful. So this was a uh, really cool paper on the abnormalities of fat metabolism and the metabolic derangements that are generally characteristic of type 2 metabolic syndrome. It's basically talking about how this, in this, in this paper where um, they're thinking that insulin resistance is starting in the adipocyte. What's an adipocyte? A fat cell, right? Eventually leading to total body insulin resistance. So in this um, article, the author writes, the sequence of events leading to whole body insulin resistance is first a positive net energy balance, just a fancy way of saying too many calories. Then triglyceride accumulation in fat buffering adipose tissue becomes limited by the development of adipose tissue insulin resistance. This results in diversion of energy substrates to non-adipose tissue, and which in turn leads to this complex array of metabolic abnormalities as we said, characteristic insulin resistance. But this to me is just part of the story. I did think it was an interesting paper to bring to your attention. <clears throat> so question, what is the largest endocrine organ in the human body? Anybody want to shout it out? Adipose, fat tissue. Even very lean individuals will have 10 to 15 pounds of adipose that contributes at least 25 different adipokines. What's an adipokine? Well, an adipokine is some kind of secretion hormone from adipose. And here's an example of a list of some of those adipokines, including we'll talk about a little bit about adiponectin, we'll talk about leptin, 
and a few others. There's many that we won't talk about, but we'll talk a f about a few of them. This is just another picture. I thought it was kind of pretty. I thought I'd put it up there, just saying the same thing. Okay, so fat tissue actually is an endocrine organ. You follow? It's not just something that just kind of looks ugly in your butt. <laughs> it actually does secrete or uh, hormones. So too many of these adipokines, some of them are good, but most of them are generally pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidative damage, meaning accelerating that aging, prod um, that aging process, clipping telomeres in the DNA, promoting insulin resistance, increasing cortisol, impairing immunity, dysregulating appetite, and ultimately contributing to one's morbid morbidity and mortality. So let's talk about adiponectin, which is actually an a interesting one. Adiponectin, which is a, a factor that's exclusively derived from adipose tissue that's been shown to exert anti-inflammatory um, action and also anti-atherogenic action. Also, it's been shown to reverse insulin, insulin resistance, mostly by increasing hepatic insulin sensitivity. In this particular um, article, the author writes, adiponectin, hormone produced solely by the adipocyte, regulator of glucose and energy homeostasis. So low adiponectin associated with decrease in insulin sensitivity in humans, shown to be predictive of future development in diabetes in, in a few studies. But if the adipocyte is too full of fat, part of the problem is that it makes less adiponectin. It's going to make less adiponectin, which is going to do what? It's going to decrease insulin sensitivity. Let's take a moment just to talk a little about a couple of um, interesting other um, hormones like leptin. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of leptin and ghrelin. Leptin. Leptin functions as a feedback mechanism that signals to your brain to stop eating and increase energy expenditure. And it's been thought that obese individuals are what's called leptin resistant. So. Leptin, a mediator of long-term regulation of energy balance, suppressing food intake. So you eat the food in an unhealthy uh, individual, the, the, the body releases this leptin that tells my brain to stop eating, right? So, so leptin is a good thing. Ghrelin, on the other hand, is a fast-acting hormone seeming uh, to play a role in meal initiation also blocking leptin's action. So kind of a simple, simple way to remember this is think of leptin as the stoplight to stop eating and ghrelin as the go light to start eating. I don't know if that helps. All right. Now this is, this is definitely very interesting. How are we, how are we, are we on time? Okay. Whew, I better whip through this. All right, so let me share with you um, so there's this award called the Banting Medal. It was named after the Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, Sir Frederick Banting, who co-discovered insulin treatment for diabetes. All right, so pretty significant. And this, this researcher, Barbara Corky, won the Banting Medal for Scientific Achievement in 2011. Okay, pretty impressive. And here's what she says. She says that she thinks that insulin resistance starts in the beta cell with hyperinsulinemia causing insulin resistance. That she says that actually what's happening is that there, there's damage to the beta cell. That's really powerful. That's very interesting. So what could be causing this damage? Well, so I think what we're saying now is that, well, there's sort of a lot here. There's a lot of different things going on. There's a lot of possibilities. And in integrative medicine, medical nutritionists take a what's called systems biology approach because, yes, we have a lot of specialists, but you know what? It's all really interconnected, isn't it? So you really have to start thinking about taking that systems bi biology approach. It's going to take into consideration not just obesity, but also hormone issues, estrogen dominance, which we are actually going to take a minute to talk about because I think it's really important. Oxidative damage, that could be, uh, that could be something that could be causing problems with the beta cell. And of course, so many things can cause oxidative damage, which we'll get into. Adrenal fatigue, high cortisol, I think um, Candace started to talk a little bit about that. Right? You don't have to have Cushing's or Addison's just to have adrenal fatigue. There is a, a range in between. I think that's becoming more and more understood and acknowledged. 
Toxins, what kinds of toxins? Well, I'm not just talking about overt toxins like cigarette smoke. I'm talking about ages. Does anybody know what that is? Advanced glycosylated endpoints and acrylamides. These are things, these are toxins. These are carcinogenic toxins that are produced when you, for example, high heat a carbohydrate, right? Like French fries, when you deep fry that, we're not just talking about the saturated fat and calories. Now we're understanding that, wait a minute, there are actually toxins that are produced when we eat this stuff that can cause oxidative damage. Trans fats, which we now understand, there is no safe level of trans fats. The American Heart Association set doesn't tell you that you should have less than 5% of your calories or less than 1%. It's zero, and zero equals zero. Right? Toxic metals, bisphenol A, PCBs, and of course the list just goes on and on. Dysbiosis, well, what does that mean? Poor gut health, well, that's very easy to get these days with the overuse and the misuse of antibiotics, poor diet, so many different possible reasons um, and easy ways to eventually develop dysbiosis. Infection, nutrient deficiency, either secondary or poor diet, or even drug-induced, yes. There are many, many drugs that induce nutrient depletions. I think we're probably the most common, most well-known are statins and CoQ10. Remember CoQ10? I mean, I'm sure most of you guys have had your biochemistry 101 by now. CoQ10, also known as ubiquinone, where was that? Remember the electron transport chain? Remember ubiquinone is extremely important in the final production of ATP from your glucose molecule? Yeah, well, you're not producing that anymore if you're putting your patients on statins. And I'm not telling you to not put your patients on statins, but what I am telling you is to be aware of the nutrient depletions that we cause when we put our patients on these medications. So we have to be, we have to be sure that this is really the right thing so for the patient. And we know that in 2012, there were two very powerful papers that came out, not in the alternative medicine journals, but in, in top-tier medical journals that showed that statins actually start to interfere with the mitochondrial machinery, right, so that statins were starting to show to actually induce uh, insulin resistance and ultimately type 2 diabetes. And this was very controversial. This was kind of a big deal. A lot, it really uh, ruffled a lot of feathers, as you can imagine, right? Because statins is, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry we're talking about. All right, so really quick, which of the following labs should raise a red flag as a possible sign of insulin resistance? Fasting blood glucose of 98. Fasting insulin of 19. A1C of 6. None of the above. All of the above. That's right. All of the above. Right? Because, again, we said that you can have a fasting blood sugar of 98, and certainly you can be hyperinsulinemic. And really, to check, what would you do? Just order the insulin. Order fasting insulin. Very easy. Simple blood test. No big deal. Insurance covers it. Okay? So what do we say? You can go as high as for insulin level. You can go as high as 25, but we really want to keep those insulin levels where? You really want those insulin levels to be as low as 6 or 5 or 4 or even 3. So what do you think? What dietary, um, what, I mean, there's many different things you can do, but what is the one simplest, fastest way to cut insulin? Tell your patient to stop doing what? Stop eating so many what? Carbs. <laughs> That's right, and we're not talking about putting everybody on this crazy low, 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 low carb diet, but let's face it, we all eat too many carbs, and it's the number one driver in, of insulin. Now, they're general, there's a lot, I mean, calories in general, but cutting those carbs will help a lot. All right, let's move on. Um, we're not going to have time to really get into this. I'll just mention very, very briefly that we eat, being that we eat every day, uh, multiple times a day, hopefully, and not just once a day, but diet is the most important environmental factor influencing expression of genetic information because of our constant information or constant exposure, excuse me, to food, right? Don't some of you have snacks in front of you right now? You eat every single day. What else do you do every single day, three, four, five times a day? So because of that, technically, diet is the most important environmental factor. So it's not just because we carry certain genetics, but it's the way we bathe those genes. So even if you carry gene variants that mark you susceptible to a complex disease, those variations alone don't necessarily make you ill. It's the, it's the presence of certain behaviors that trigger those genes. And when we, 
when we look at this concept, what we understand that it's not just genetics alone and it's not just what you eat, it's the combination and the interaction of genes, or your genes and nutrition. And this entire, this, this is a whole other field called nutritional genomics or nutrigenomics. Um, I want to spend just a minute or two talking about this uh, insulin resistance and estrogen connection because I think it's very important that you guys at least get like five minutes of this in your medical um, school training. So we start with that poor diet, which obviously leads to, you know, obesity, too much fat tissue. And naturally, we have all these pro-inflammatory cytokines that are being produced, right? So prostaglandin E2 and a variety of other pro-inflammatory cytokines that are being produced. But what that ends up leading to is all this insulin um, production. And we know that too much insulin can then go on to produce elevated levels of aromatase. Now, what's aromatase? Well, you know that it ends in ASC, so that's a hint. and It's an enzyme, right? So aromatase is a key enzyme in the biosynthesis of estrogen. Specifically, it helps to um, it helps um, take androgens and convert them into um, estrogen. So insulin aromatizes androgens into estrogens. And also, too much insulin, too much insulin can lead to decreased levels of sex hormone binding globulin. And these two together will free up more estrogen, right? So, so now what happens is you've got all this extra or excessive estrogen, and this estrogen may not be being cleared out properly. You may, um, and that's a whole other story, glucuronidation of estrogen. But the idea is that this excessive estrogen production is then going to lead to more inflammatory cytokines. So if I had a, if I had the ability to draw a negative feedback loop here, I would draw an, an arrow, right, with that which then um, lead to actually a positive feedback loop, which would then produce more inflammatory cytokines, leading to more insulin, higher levels of aromatase, lower levels of sex hy uh, hormone binding globulin, and then again increased estrogen levels. So this is sort of negative vicious cycle. So to clarify, it's not just being fat that increases estrogen by increasing the amount of aromatase. It's in the adipocyte that it's the adipocyte that secretes less adiponectin. Remember what we said adiponectin was? It was that hormone that did what? That decreased insulin resistance. So when there's less adiponectin because it's too full of fat, increasing insulin resistance, which increases insulin levels, which then decreases sex hormone binding globulin and leads to increased free estrogen levels, secreting all those pro-inflammatory cytokines, which then stimulates more aromatase to produce more estrogen. So you see this negative vicious cycle. So here's a question. What about lipo? How about we just lipo it all out? Might liposuction be a way to decrease inflammation, decrease estrogen levels, and improve health? That's a, that's a fair question. Well, that question was asked in the New England Journal of Medicine about a, almost a decade ago. And what they found was, well, here's a picture, actually, of um, the subject before lipo and then after. It was 20 pounds that they were actually able to remove, 20 pounds. And what they found was that lipo actually did not significantly alter insulin sensitivity of muscle, li liver, or adipose tissue. It did not significantly alter plasma concentrations of C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and adiponectin did not significantly affect other risk factors for coronary heart disease. Why do you think? Why do you think? Well, because there's a difference between subcutaneous fat and what? This, right, visceral fat, exactly. And it seems like it's the visceral fat that's what? The bad actor here. So, lipo didn't work because it eliminates the subcutaneous fat, which is fine, but it didn't re uh, actually g get rid of any visceral fat. Liposuction will eliminate fat cells, but it doesn't actually shrink the size of the adipocyte left behind. And we find that it's the visceral fat adipocyte that's really most problematic. And really the only way to get rid of that is through diet and exercise. So no, there's really no quick fix. So we see that insulin dysregulation is involved in obviously type 2, hyperlipidemia, heart disease, certain types of cancer, probably um, breast cancer, probably because of that estrogen connection, PCOS fatty liver, but also I'm going to take just a minute, I wasn't going to do this and then ah, threw it in there anyway, um, Alzheimer's. So maybe you know by now that Alzheimer's has been referred to as type 3 diabetes. Did you know that, that Alzheimer's is actually, yes, Alzheimer's is type 3 diabetes, why? Okay, well, 
let's just start by saying that there's a gene that we all carry. It's called the APOE gene, right? We have an APOE gene, but they're kind of, there's, there's a variety of variations. You can have the E2, E3, or E4 variant, or any combination. So we all have two copies, right? One that we inherit from biological mother and one that we inherit from our biological father. So you could be E22, 33, 23, whatever, right? 34, 24. Now, if you have the APOE4 allele, that's the one that's been associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's. So if you've got one copy and you're heterozygous, well, that's one thing. And certainly if you've got two copies or homozygous for the APOE4 allele, well, then you're at really high risk, aren't you? Now, here's the thing, and here's a relationship briefly, and I'm just, this is sort of oversimplified, but briefly, in the Alzheimer's brain, you've got these amyloid plaques that require to be broken down by, of all things, insulin degrading uh, enzyme, IDE, insulin degrading enzyme. Great. Well, what if you're insulin resistant? What if you're insulin resistant and you're not really degrading insulin? Well, IDE clears both insulin and those amyloid beta plaques in the brain. So I would suggest to you then that to think of this as carrying the APOE4 allele as the loaded gun, but what would be the trigger? Does it guarantee that you're going to get Alzheimer's if you carry the gene? No. We actually now understand, yeah, obviously you're at increased risk, but the, that, you're the, that's a loaded gun. What can pull the trigger potentially is for your patient to be insulin resistant. Now, just yesterday, I had a patient come in, a young man, whose grandfather um, has Alzheimer's and his mother, grandmother is on, his, on her way. And there are now labs that can actually check for APOE, and they're all covered by insurance. So we checked yesterday. We just buckle swabbed him, and we're checking his APOE gene. We're going to see what version he's got. And, of course, what, do you th what else do you think I checked? His insulin. That's right. So we're going to find out if he's got the APOE4 deal, and we also want to know what his insulin levels are. Now, he's slightly overweight. He's not. I, 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 so we don't know. The jury is out. We'll see. So naturally, if it comes back that he's got one or hopefully not two, but a copy of the APOE4, and he's got elevated insulin, what does that suggest? It means he, it's not, it's not an absolute, but it definitely means he's at super high risk down the road. All right. Here's an article that was uh, fairly recently published about six, seven years ago. We conclude that the term type 3 diabetes actu accurately reflects the fact that Alzheimer's disease represents a form of diabetes that selectively involves the brain and has molecular and biochemical features that overlap with both type 1 and type 2. All right. So now the neurological guy has to know, you know, endocrine, huh? Okay, this is a really interesting um, paper I want to throw out there. The gist of this paper was basically that, okay, so by the way, all of these poor diet habits affect your physiology quickly. It doesn't take months and months and months of poor eating to have negative effects on your health. A highly processed, calorie-dense, nutrient-depleted diet leads to exaggerated Supra physiologic postprandial, postprandial meaning after a meal, spikes in blood, glucose and lipids. This postprandial dysmetabolism induces immediate oxidant stress. And what did that, that doctor, Dr. Corky, was her name? What did she say? That she thought that insulin resistance was related to what? Damage at the beta cell? And this guy is basically talking about immediate oxidant stress which increases in direct proportion to the increases in glucose and triglycerides after a meal. These transient increases in free radicals acutely triggers atherogenic changes, including inflammation, endothelial function, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm trying to say is, folks, that the sooner you intervene and advocate for your patient, the better. Right? These results are relatively fast. You all need to be voices of encouragement. And if you don't have the time, what do you do? Refer. I just, uh, again, you will have a team of healthcare professionals standing at your side, at your beck and call. You guys are going to be future doctors. You guys are going to have a lot of power. Trust me. You guys call the shots. Your patients will do generally what you tell them. When it comes from your mouth, they generally take it pretty seriously. You will have the largest impact on your patients' lives, if not the largest impact. 
you really have to take that seriously. All right. You know what this is? Anybody ever hear the uh, hardtack grill in LA? Oh yeah, I, I don't have these numbers memorized. I gotta look at my paper here. Okay, the quadruple bypass burger weighs in at, check this out, just under 10,000 calories a pop. Yeah, it contains three pounds of ground beef. Hey, and you can also get french fries cooked in lard. And if you weigh over 300 pounds, 350 pounds, you get to eat for free. <laughs> So the story is that not only did the spokesperson for this particular uh, dining facility actually end up get having an MIN died, but apparently a couple of restaurant patrons also had these um, some some signs and symptoms of uh, MIN had to be treated for that after they dined in this place. So you don't, yeah, we don't want to be doing this. Okay, move on. All right, so really quick, William, a 50-year-old attorney presents with a fasting blood glucose of 129, triglycerides of 240, and a BMI of 25. All right, let's just think really quick. 20, 129, is that a diagnosis of type 2? Yes, 126 or higher. Triglycerides of 240, is that abnormally high? Yeah, that's a little too high. BMI of 25, right at the tip, 24.9 was the cutoff. What is, uh, which of the following dietary interventions is the best not the only, but the best choice for William. Is it to A, decrease saturated fat? <coughs> decrease caloric intake? Decrease carbohydrate intake? Or D, increase protein intake? What do you think? Yeah, C, very good. And the reason is because you could do the other things, but the, mo the one that's going to make the most, uh, get, give you the most bang for your buck is C, carbohydrate intake, because not only will controlling carbohydrate intake help control blood sugars quickly, but we know that it's really not fats that drive triglycerides. What is it? Too many what in the diet will drive triglyceride production? Carbs. Right, so when you see your patient's triglyceride levels elevated, you want to think this, part, this person's either drinking too much alcohol or eating too, much, too many carbohydrates, especially the processed carbohydrates. Um, so we're not talking about drastic low carbohydrate diets, um, but carbohydrate intake will um, definitely, lowering carbohydrate intake will definitely help tremendously with all of those things. All right, let's move on. I, I had this slide, uh, Candace already talked about it. Uh, it was that 2002 study, so we were thinking on the same track here, where again, lifestyle, my numbers are just reported in a slightly different way. Uh, it's sort of in, uh, it's basically explaining that lifestyle intervention decreased the incidence of type 2 by 58% compared to metformin. You guys are going to find that the most commonly used medication is called metformin. A brand name is glucophage, decreased type 2 by only 31%. So let me make sure you guys really, really sunk in. Lifestyle was better than drugs. Okay, lifestyle better than drugs. So, again, diet is the most important environmental factor influencing um, expression. So this is really cool in the Journal of uh, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition 2007. There's a comparison of a variety of diets. Very quickly, we are running out of time, so I'm just going to tell you right now that they looked at about 12 different kinds of eating plans, and they looked at a variety of different indices, including weight, weight, circumference, insulin sensitivity, inflammation, probably measured by CRP, total cholesterol, HDL, etc. And the only eating plan, according to this particular study, that showed a positive effect in every single one of those biomarkers was Mediterranean diet. So what's the Mediterranean diet? In a nutshell, a Mediterranean diet is going to have a higher emphasis on fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, whole grains, nuts, legumes, fish, olive oil, and interestingly enough, a de decreased emphasis on wine. And when you really examine the Mediterranean diet, what you see that it is high in monounsaturated fats. The, um, not, not, you're not going to have a lot of those high glycemic index carbs, as Candace was referring to, and a lot of phytonutrients, which, by the way, phytonutrients are not classified as vitamins and minerals. Phytonutrients or phytochemicals, which is synonymous, are a whole other thing. It's essentially what makes a blueberry blue, okay, as an example. So it's the lycopene in tomatoes, it's the resveratrol in grapes, it's the sulfurophanes in cruciferous vegetables, which has been shown over and over and over again uh, in, in cancer, uh, to be positive um, to help with cancer. Zeaxanthin and yellow bell peppers, lignans and flax, isoflavones and soy, anthocyanins and raspberries. <coughs> 
These are not vitamins and minerals. The, and by the way, there are thousands and thousands of phytochemicals compared to only a couple of dozens of vitamins and minerals. And what we understand is that it's not about any one powerful phytochemical, it's really the complex mixture of all of them. So when you're biting into that apple, you're not just biting into a vitamin, you're biting into a, a complex symphony of nutrition and phytochemicals. So, and this is just another article talking about Mediterranean diet and, and the positive effect uh, as far as um, development of diabetes. So if you think you don't have time for this, according to this guy, you sooner or later will have to find time for illness. I thought that was very interesting. So this concept that one size fits all is definitely out, you know, out are the days uh, of one blockbuster drug. Uh, lifestyle medicine is very, very in. And I'm going to skip over this, but this is just kind of a way to organize your thoughts about how to assess uh, your patient in terms of their diet, what needs to go in, and asking the question, what needs to come out. So I really have to pass over this. And this probably is a whole other subject. And uh, naturally, it doesn't help that the standard American diet is really quite sad, isn't it? Uh, characterized by a lot of refined sugar, flour, preservatives, additives. Yeah, this came out of a book, a really neat book with all these beautiful pictures, uh, images of what the world eats and had pictures for every country. And this was a country for, this was the picture for the United States. <coughs> yep. All right, so... Basically, uh, not only is the quality of the diet bad, but also somebody asked a question about timing, and this is pretty typical. You know, you wake up, you have your coffee and your carbs and your Pop-Tarts, and a couple hours later, maybe you're having more coffee and carbs, and then you have your mid-afternoon crash, and then more coffee and carbs, and then a really, really huge dinner, and then, of course, you know, the sugar and the alcohol afterwards, and then hopefully you'll try to get a little rest uh, if you can. Ideally, we want to counsel our patients to have small frequent meals throughout the day and have a little bit of protein in the morning, kind of wake up that brain. We really don't have time to get into supplements, which is a, and, and I hate that, that we never have time to get into micronutrients, because we always, we, we, we always say that, oh, we don't have time to talk about this. But micronutrients are just as important, if not more important, than macronutrients when it comes to a discussion about nutrition. And this is really important stuff that I may uh, be able to share with you at a later time because we understand that insulin's ability to bind with the receptor and the strength of the cellular signal is dependent upon the presence of adequate, not just fats and carbs, but really micronutrients, right? So we're also concerned about the health of the receptor. <coughs> and this just gets into various micronutrients like vitamin D and um, omega-3 fats, very fascinating stuff. Uh, I'll skip to this one particular slide that's really kind of neat. I'm sorry I have to get skip right all through all this. I think this is the really cool one, the mechanism. The mechanism being, and I think this is really neat, because basically this is exactly the way metformin works. The idea is that the omega-3 fat combines with P par, um, is a PPAR gamma agonist and together form this transcription factor, which ultimately affects genetic expression. If you look at the way metformin works, it's the same thing. Metformin is a PPAR agonist. That's how it sensitizes insulin. Omega-3 omega omega fats do the same thing, right? Obviously, they're not as powerful as metformin, but they have the same mechanism. And if you dose it correctly and get them on the right diet, you can make a huge impact without having to use a lot of those medications that have side effects. And by the way, metformin, does anybody know the nutrient that metformin will deplete you of? Folic acid. So now you have to be careful of the fact that you're using the medication, but now you have to make sure that your patient's supplementing with folic acid. So you have to be careful. So a lot of information about nutrients and phytochemicals and how they signal uh, insulin pathways. Obviously, the um, importance of exercise is extremely important. We know that exercise stimulates GLUT4, which is a... Um, glucose transport protein, translocation in skeletal muscle, and in patients with type 2 can actually help to normalize GLUT4 translocation. So what fits your busy schedule? Um, exercising an hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? I thought it was kind of cute. All right. Stress management, obviously very important. And then my concluding thoughts. All right. Here we go. Final slide. Please know that health and disease exists in a continuum, okay, that when your patient has a fasting blood sugar of 99, that should, that should trigger something, something, okay? 
early detection and really prevention is the key. Now I get that prevention is not uh, a big money maker. You're going to find that out. Right? Procedures is where the money is at. But this is best medicine. Do not underestimate the power of food and nutritional medicine. Please ask your patients what they are eating and drinking. Thank you for pointing that out. Because the questions that we ask determine the answers that we come up with. If you're not even willing to ask the question, you may not be able to come up with the right answers. Consider that nearly all chronic disease, yes, nearly all chronic disease, and I'm throwing in autoimmune diseases, I see that every day, fibromyalgia, pain disorders, mitochondrial myopathy, can be addressed with food and nutrition. And I challenge you guys as future doctors to actually think about pharmacology as alternative medicine. Because we want to first do no harm. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for having me today, guys. Thank you so much.